Zac Efron, Down to Earth is Zac Efron inspired me to go. Oh, it was a good show. Our Earth is fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think I need to fade it in here a little more though, so I'm gonna work on that. No, I don't know. This is like, I don't know how that doesn't like hit you. I, I hate it actually. I'm gonna, it's, it's gonna be gone soon. Okay, anyway. <laughs> hey guys, welcome to Restoration who, who Church. Who grows beards? Who can give Ross some beard advice? Yeah, I need, I need some beard advice. <laughs> Get some wax in there. Yeah, yeah like but that. happy Sunday, August. Ninth? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. hey, we're, if you're, we're online today, we're so online welcome today. to Church yeah. Online. If you're a guest with us, uh, here's a connection form to fill out. This is Ross Manders. I'm Emily Manders. Oh, yeah. I keep forgetting that. There's I know. People hear me that You know. assume that people know who yeah. you are. It's not fair. Um, so there's a form to fill out. We would encourage you to do that because uh, we'd love to get to know you, first of all. Uh, we'd love to help you get connected to the life of restoration, but um, for every form that we receive, we give $3 to the Interfaith Food Alliance here in Morrisville, which is the local food pantry. So you're helping uh, someone with food insecurity get a food, uh, get some food on their table. Uh, you'll also get a sweet gift in the mail, mm -hmm. which is a, a really cool um, restoration mug. So we'll put that in the mail for you. So let us know who you are. We'd love to connect with you. There yep. are... Um... Check the microwave. <laughs> Children. Hi. There are um, two quick things we want to draw our attention to. Yeah? Attention. What are they, Ross? Right. Serving? Sure. Mm hmm and next week. Oh. Because, yeah, okay. I was going to say, right now our kids are doing the Simply Loved curriculum in the other room. Oh, yeah. With our um, babysitter, Mackenzie, and they're loving it. So yeah, that's if your kids cool. haven't tried that yet, check it out. It's on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other two things <laughs> is that um, serving opportunities. Uh, we know that we haven't been having a lot of opportunities to serve um, on Sunday mornings, but we do have them now either on the lawn or in person. We also have some custodial opportunities coming up. So if you would like to start serving in some capacity, then- uh, You're talking funny today. <laughs> I'm really, I feel like I'm really close you to the- You are really close. I know, this is, Here comes do, Luke. Do you guys notice this is different than usual? Yeah, we're at our house. Yeah, and we're doing this on a phone. <laughs> um, fill out this form though. We're gonna put it, we're gonna link a form in the comments. So hit that, hit that link and then you can start serving hospitality roles, custodial, things like that. The other thing is Let's that- Let's vote. Does Luke need a haircut? You can chat about that with us. No. I'm <laughs> Luke, Luke says no. Luke, do you want a man bun? No. No! Oh, Aunt Sophie. Okay. She needs a haircut too. She wants a man bun though. No, I guys, guys, I have a question. What do you think about Simply Loved? Was it fun? Yeah. Yeah. Would you recommend other kids do it? Other restoration kids? Yep. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Mm -hmm. Recommendation from straight from a kid. Cool. Mm -hmm. 
I interrupted you. Next week, August 16th, we are on the lawn at 9 o'clock. If you would like to join us. And online at 9 and 10.30. We'll also be online at 9 and 10.30. But if you'd like to join us in person, weather permitting, of course, yes, 9 o'clock on the lawn. Um, and bring your lawn chair or something to sit on because we don't provide that. Yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of shade, so you can bring a tent if you'd like, but there is quite a bit of shade. We're trying to set it up so that people can take tonight. advantage of the shade. Yep. Luke's going to baseball, baseball tonight. tonight, that's right. Okay. Every night. So that's really about it. Um, well, so this this past two, two Wednesday evenings, we've been doing a yeah. mini-series on money because we know that's a high stressor. Has hey, anybody Luke, caught Luke, that? Anybody seen Luke, it? Please leave. Yeah. Please go. That's Thank enough. you. That's it. Okay. That's rude. Um, Parenting's coming up. Parenting's soon. coming up, too. <laughs> So, so we have one more week on, on money, and then three weeks on marriage, and then three weeks on parenting. And uh, yeah, some people have been watching it. How many of you guys have, have caught it? If you haven't caught it, you Luke. Can always Luke, go back to our YouTube Luke, channel. Luke, for Girls, the love of. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> Sorry. Let it go. Parenting is coming up, and you're gonna hear my sage advice on parenting. Um, money. Yeah. Money. We. So, so one of the things that we've been talking about is that how, how worry is a very common word in the association with money. Um, but that if we could understand that we are managers of God's resources and um, that he has called us to be good stewards of what he has entrusted to us, that that's certainly that's one little sliver of many of the things we talked you about. You know what, though? I'm studying Jonah right now, and in my Bible study, the teacher says the same thing about our life, that we are... As our whole life is yes, entrusted. It's yes, it's not even just our resources, Absolutely. but it's our whole life. Yeah, so I thought that was an interesting concept because you know Jonah's running from what God's asked him to do, right? Right. So yes, but he's acting like the owner instead of the manager uh -huh. of his life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. All all of that we have has been entrusted mm -hmm. to us. That's Jesus's point in the parable of the talents. Oh, is it? Yeah. Mm. It's cool though. Which I didn't talk about that, but no. But um, I like that application of Jonah. I hadn't thought about that yeah. before. I thought, ooh, that's what Ross always says about money when I read that. Yes. No. It's all of it's all of our time and energy and breath yeah. and everything that we possess. Mm -hmm. and hold on to has been entrusted to us so we believe that very firmly at restoration church um and so we want to thank you for your generosity to restoration yeah and uh i think we have a lot of people who are really working this and really trying to be good stewards of what god has entrusted to them so thank you for that um if you would like to continue to contribute to the cause of christ here financially you can do so in four easy ways you can give online you can give by texting a dollar amount to 84321 you could give through our app or you could give through dropping a check or cash in an envelope into the mail slot. Or the so, mail, period. Or the or mail, period. Drive. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yep. Alrighty, uh, you want to say a prayer for us? Since you haven't done much talking? No. Did I not do enough talking? <laughs> I can pray. Should you remember? Okay. <laughs> you put me on. That's not very nice. Okay. Marriage is coming up. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Father, we thank you um, that we have the opportunity to still gather together, even if it's virtual, um, even when we miss each other. We thank you that we're still gathered online and that we can learn from your word and that we can worship together and be community, um, even if it's virtual. And we just pray that you would continue to guide our community. Um, I know a lot of us have a lot of decisions to make about this upcoming school year, what it looks like for our various families. Um, I know a lot of people have other decisions to make related to the state of the world. And so I just pray that you would give us the wisdom that we need, um, that you'd help us to tune in to your Holy Spirit, yeah. because we know that you're speaking um, and we desire to hear from you. So I pray that you'd help us to hear your voice clearly in these coming weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I thank you that you have given us life and breath in our lungs. And I pray that we would be um, faithful stewards of all that you've given to us not only our money, but also our very lives, that um, we would trust you and um, remember that we are not the owner or the boss of our life, but that if we trust in you, that you have a lot um, that you would like to um, influence in our lives. And so I just pray that we'd be open to that. Yeah. And um, we just thank you for this time and for the offering that will be received virtually online through the mail we thank you for the gifts that you are providing for mm -hmm. restoration so mm -hmm. we can continue your work in our surrounding community and honestly in the online world because that's where we are existing right now in right. jesus name we pray amen, amen. in paul's letter to the colossians he describes the gospel of jesus this way when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh God made you alive with Christ. God did this. So notice that it's not our work. God made us alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, 
which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. And so now we are known that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you have done for us. When we were in such great need, when there was no chance or hope for us to accomplish this on our own, Father, you made a way for us by nailing our sin to the cross so that we would not have to stand condemned. Thank you, Father, for what you have done for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed, sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus.
down from glory to bear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has broken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. You need to I'm yours forever.
Father, thank you despite the fact that we were at the base of a mountain we could not climb and a bit too deep to crawl out of, Father. You came down to rescue us. And you did for us what we could not do for ourselves, Father. You lived a life that was without sin, in love, for each person you encountered, and for the world, Father. And you died a life that you didn't deserve. And in this exchange and substitution, Father, you gave us your life. And so, Father, we thank you that there is a living hope that can withstand any trouble that we might face upon this planet. May we not lose heart, Father, for you have overcome the world. May we know that you are worthy of our confidence and worthy of our trust. You proved yourself to be good, Father, and we know then that whatever we face, Father, we can continue to trust in your goodness. So, Father, we do that and we commit ourselves to that today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today we are continuing our series simply titled Jonah. I would again always encourage you to have your scripture with you or a, uh, an app with the Bible on it. This is a story ultimately and so I would encourage you to follow along uh, with your Bibles. And if you have missed of course any uh, weeks of this series so far you can always go back and listen to them uh, via our podcast or on the media tab of our website or if you go to Facebook or our YouTube channel. A lot of opportunities and ways to listen to past messages. To recap where we've been, God called Jonah to go and preach against the wickedness of the Assyrians, particularly those living in the capital city of Nineveh. For a lot of reasons, though, Jonah didn't want to go to the Ninevites, and so instead he runs in the completely opposite direction. He boarded a boat headed for Spain, and because this boat was full of pagan Gentiles, people that he didn't like, people that he didn't care about, people that he didn't want to associate with, He went down by himself into the hull of the ship, and he fell asleep. And while asleep, this great and terrible storm arose up on the sea, threatening the lives of everybody on board. And so the captain of the ship goes down into the hull of the ship, and he wakes Jonah up and asks him why he is being so lazy, why he is so unconcerned, why he is so apathetic, why he is being so selfish. Because the sailors believe that the storm is happening because some god was offended, and therefore the great and terrible storm is coming upon the sea. And they begin peppering Jonah with questions and hope that they'll discover which God is angry and therefore then learn what they can do to appease this God. It's discovered that he's a Hebrew and that his God is the God of the Jews, the God who is alive, the God who is active, the God who decimated the Egyptians, the God who conquered the Canaanites. The fame and the glory of this God and his renown had been known throughout the whole world by this point. And so everybody knows who the God of the Hebrews is. And they then are afraid. They are terrified upon learning who his God is. And so we're told, this terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Right, we have to appease this God, so what should we do? How do we make this God happy? Well, Jonah says, pick me up, throw me into the sea. Notice that he doesn't say, kill me. You know, that would really be the easy way out. Take that harpoon and shove it into my stomach. Rather, let me become the subject of God's anger. Let me become the subject of God's anger. And this is actually really important because there is a much larger story being told here. But before we get to that very important part, Jonah replied, And the sea will become calm for you. I know that it is my fault that the storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. 
Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Now, this is nothing short of miraculous. Remember that from verse 1, Jonah had great disdain for pagans, for Gentiles, for idol worshipers. He hated the Assyrians enough that he would rather see them perish than tell them about the mercy of God. He would do everything in his power to never encounter them. He was lazy and he was apathetic and he was unconcerned about the fate of pagans, about the fate of Gentiles, about the fate of those who worshipped idols. These pagan sailors were certainly in that boat, right? They were Gentiles, they were pagans, they were idol worshippers. And the storm, though, was threatening their lives. But now Jonah is looking at them, these people that he once had great disdain for and great hatred towards. He's looking at them, and they're full of fear, and they're full of trepidation, but they're doing everything in their power to survive, and they're doing everything in their power to keep him alive. Notice that's an important part. They're doing everything in their power, rowing back to shore, doing everything in their power to keep him alive as well. And perhaps for the very first time in Jonah's life, he is beginning to see their humanity. These are people, right, just like him. They have families, they have fears, they have ambitions, they have dreams, they have hopes. They have treated him respectfully and with kindness. They don't want to harm him. They want to preserve his life. They are kind. They're hardworking. They're courageous, generous people. These aren't barbarians. These people have hearts. Now, if you were with us last week, you may recall that one of the consequences of placing our identity in our own accomplishments and what we can do and our own quote-unquote deserving behavior, as Jonah had done, is that it makes everyone else an enemy and a threat. And when this happens, we look at the people who are different than us People with different skin color, people who worship differently, people who look differently, people who act differently, people who believe differently and worship differently, people with different habits, different ways of life, and we tend to reduce them down to these characteristics, these differing characteristics, until they are dehumanized, and then we can feel justified in treating them poorly, or treating them with hostility, or treating them apathetically. See, this was Jonah's M.O. towards everybody who didn't look like him or act like him or believe what he believed. To everybody who wasn't an Israelite, this was just Jonah's mode of operation. But perhaps, maybe, for the very first time in his life, he was beginning to see these men, these sailors, are also human. These men are also made in the image of God. Right? They aren't savages. No, they have hearts. And perhaps for the first time, he's beginning to understand the nature of mercy, that everybody needs it, very much including himself. And if he needs it, and they need it, then that is something that actually connects them. That is something that unites them. And so he says, gentlemen, throw me over. Let me endure God's judgment. Why? Because the sea will become quiet for you. Because I know I am the reason this storm has come upon you. See, he is no longer looking at himself. He is maybe for the very first time thinking of the other. And often the first step towards God is when we finally start thinking of somebody, anybody, other than ourselves. See, Jonah thought for probably his, own, his whole life that a vertical relationship to God was sufficient and really all that God required. As long as I have my stuff together with God, as long as I am right with God, as long as I am doing what God is asking me to do, it does not matter how I relate to everybody else around me. A vertical relationship with God is really all that God requires. That his love for God didn't need to bleed out onto others. That to love God merely meant adoration and sacrifice and worship. And you could leave the temple having done your due diligence. And you could not be concerned about your neighbor and not be concerned about those in need. And the love that I have for God does not need to bleed out upon anybody else around me. And every time that the Israelites did this, and they did it often if you read the Old Testament, this is the way they lived their lives. Every time the Israelites did this, God shook his head in disbelief. 
I mean, Israel, he would say, you, you know that the Ten Commandments, right? There are ten simple commandments that I've given you. The first four are in relation to me, but the last six are also all about how you relate to your neighbor. Yes, I want you to have a love for me, but you must have a love for your neighbor. And then I gave you, in the law, God would say, I gave you an additional 603 commandments that are all practical examples of what it meant to love your neighbor in your particular context. So, of course, God would say, Israel, I am concerned with how you love your neighbor. Your love for me must bleed out upon your neighbor because if it does not, God would say, your love for me is not genuine. Your love for me is not true. They depend on each other. You can't, as John says, love me who you can't see and hate your brother. I mean, if anyone says I love God yet hates his brother, right? He's a liar, For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has seen. Jesus said, whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you also did to me. And so your love for God must then also be a love for your neighbor. The the, the greatest commandment, Jesus would say, is not just a love for God. No, it is the practical application also of that love for God spilling out upon your neighbor. But how many Christians walk into church, or of course in our context in this day and age right now, how many of us sign on and then sign off? We walk into church, we walk out, we think we've done what's required of us, and we turn and we curse one another. And we turn, we verbally and we physically and emotionally abuse one another. And we're unconcerned for those who are hungry, and we're unconcerned for those who are needy, and we just are apathetic towards the world, towards those whom God's love in us is supposed to spill out onto. James, the half-brother of Jesus, told us, do not merely listen to the word. Because if that's all you do, you are deceiving yourselves. No, my friends, do what it says. Because whoever looks intently into the perfect law, the perfect law is the love for God, by the way. He defines that elsewhere. The perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it. Not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. They are the ones who will be blessed in what they do. Faith, he continues, a little later, if it is not accompanied by action, it is dead. So this faith that is just vertical and not horizontal does not exist, they would say. Your vertical relationship to God, your love for God must spill out upon the world if it is to be a genuine love for God. And Jonah, maybe, perhaps, for the very first time, is starting to realize this. Because Jonah, in this moment, offers himself up to the wrath of the waves so that his neighbors won't have to endure them. And this is love exemplified in its truest form. See, all life-changing love is some kind of substitutionary sacrifice. True love will always follow the pattern of personal sacrifice for the betterment of another person. This is why even though our culture promotes love as the highest virtue, we are still so broken and we are still so hurting and we are still so lost as a people because the love we promote isn't actually for the betterment of another person, but rather the love that we promote is really for the comfort of the self. In our culture, love is just transactional. It gives as long as what it receives is greater than what it has to sacrifice. I was reminded this past week of the Amos schoolhouse shootings that took place back in 2006 in Lancaster. I wasn't living out here, but of course I had heard about them um, because they were worldwide news. You may recall a lone gunman took hostage 10 girls. He shot eight of them, killing five before he himself committed suicide. The world was just simply outraged as they tried to answer why. Why would this man do this? But the Amish startled the world when, as a community, they forgave the killer. The one who had massacred their children, they forgave him, and this startled the world. You may remember, they came to the shooter's funeral, expressing support for the traumatized family that he left behind. And individual families of the ones who had lost children did this as well. It wasn't just a a community thing, but although the whole Amish community forgave the killers, but the individual families forgave the killer as well. 
sociologist studying the event wrote this. The American society that we now live in can no longer produce people capable of the same response, the same response like the Amish people had, to forgive those who had offended them so greatly. America, they say, is now a culture of self-assertion in which all people are encouraged to express themselves and to assert their rights. But the Amish community, by contrast, had created a culture of self-renunciation, patterned on Jesus' self-sacrifice, renouncing rights in the service of others. Because it has lost the idea of self-giving and self-sacrificial Our society cannot provide its members with the resources for the basic requirement of human life in society. We are always going to hurt. We're always going to be broken. We're always going to be hurting each other because a self-sacrificial love for the betterment of the other is not the way that we live. But it doesn't mean that it cannot be reclaimed. So tonight... Before you go to bed, I want to challenge you to take an inventory of all the times today that you said, me first, me first. Maybe instead of sharing your water with your child, you drank it all yourself and you berated them for not bringing their own to the baseball game. Or maybe you took the last portion of food at dinner, even though your spouse had indicated that she was still hungry. Maybe you walk past the sink full of dirty dishes on your way to the TV, assuming that somebody else would take care of it. Maybe you drove past that homeless person standing out in front of that Arby's with a sign that said, please, I am hungry. Maybe you didn't put the seat up when you were peeing, not even thinking that there are women in this household. Maybe you left the room a mess and figured somebody else would clean it up. Then, after acknowledging all the times today that you said, me first, I want to challenge you to confess it. To agree that it was wrong, that your behavior, or your lack thereof, hurt someone. And then I want you to make a vow to do differently tomorrow. And I want you to ask God for the grace and the power of his Holy Spirit to help you do differently tomorrow. And the reason I hope this for you is because you were created, designed to live into this kind of sacrificial love for the betterment of another person. Sacrificial love is the fuel the human person was actually designed to live on. I still remember several several years ago, um, my son Luke brought to me a remote controller. Uh, He was just a little kid at this time. He brought to me a remote controller and he said, Daddy, Daddy, it doesn't work. So I looked at it and I pressed some buttons and I don't know, you know, it seemed fine. I, I turned it over and I opened up the battery case and here is what I saw. I saw that there were two carrots stuffed inside of the remote control, which of course the remote control was not designed to function on carrot power and therefore, of course, the remote did not work. And my friends, this is just an analogy of the human person. We were designed to live on sacrificial love, and when we don't, our relationships and our culture, our society, our neighborhoods, our households, our relationships with our family and spouse and children and coworkers and neighbors, none of these work right. And you know this because you've experienced it. And the reason sacrificial love is our fuel for being rightly human is because we are made in God's image. And this, my friends, is how he loves. And this, my friends, is how he lives. And this, my friends, is how he interacts with us. So it shouldn't be surprised that when God came into the world to save us, he did so through substitutionary sacrifice. He looked at a world that was far from him, from, for people who had rebelled against him and rejected him and hurt him and spat on him and condemned him and fought him and cursed him, living not in love as we were designed, but living in selfish hate for one another, and compelled by love, served the world by giving his life as a ransom for many. You see, Jesus came and he died on our behalf. When God came into the world bearing our humanity and later going to the cross bearing our sin, he became the greatest example of the fulfillment of this pattern of love. 
He gave his life for the betterment of others. He gave his life for our life. But that's not all that the story of Jonah actually points to. Then we're told that Jonah, they, they, they picked up Jonah and they threw him overboard. And we're told that the raging sea grew calm. The anger of the storm was a representation of the anger of God towards his rebellious prophet and the nation he represented, namely Israel. All of this was turned away from Jonah, from, from the sailors, from, from those on the sea, when Jonah hit the waves. And in the same way, Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf was a propitiation. Propitiation is just a fancy and an old word that means Christ dealt with the wrath of God on sin and evil by standing in our place, by being our substitute and bearing the punishment that we rightly deserved. All of God's wrath on sin was poured out on Christ so that it wouldn't have to be poured out on us. All of God's condemnation on sin was crucified in the flesh of Christ so that we could stand before God without condemnation. See, he substitutes himself for us. John Stott, a New Testament scholar, says that substitution lies at the heart of both sin and salvation. For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Man claims prerogatives which belong to God alone. God accepts penalties which belong to man alone. And so, my friends, to the degree that you can grasp what Jesus did for you and rest in the salvation that he bought for you, to that degree, this pattern of substitutionary sacrifice and love will be reproduced in your relationships And my friends, only then will you become the kind of person that this world so desperately needs. This is why I say that we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every single day. We need to preach the gospel to ourselves every single moment. We need to remind ourselves of the gospel and what Christ has done for us. Because only in this, remembering and being empowered, can we then go and love our spouse and our children and our coworkers and our neighbors and our family members in the way that God has called us to love them. We need to remind ourselves of the love of God for us every single day because God's love for us is always and only the source of our love for others. And Jonah began in this moment to realize this. Even before he knew his story was a precursor to the gospel of Christ, he began to realize this because the impact on the sailors to all of this is just so astonishing. At this, we're told, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. See, when Jonah hit the water, the sea calmed from its raging immediately and this caused the sailors to fear the Lord. This is a covenantal name. It's not some generic name for God. This is the name Yahweh. It's a covenantal, intimate, personal name for the Lord. They are not referring to some tribal deity, right? They're not referring to some generic God out in the distance. They are not referring to some God that they no longer never understood or never knew. The experience with Jonah and his God, this had converted the sailors at this moment. They committed themselves to following after this God, to ditching all of their tribal deities who had no power to save them in this moment, and they trusted in the Lord, in Yahweh. Now, foxhole conversions are commonplace. They're, they're, they're notorious. My friend Dan, he's an Iraqi war vet, he, he often says that there are no atheists in foxholes. Because when there's impending doom at your doorstep, it's easy to cry out to God and, and confess your sins and ask that, you know, whatever happens to you in this moment, that somehow God's mercy will invite you into his paradise. But you need to know that these men are different. They made their vows after the danger had passed. This wasn't in the midst of the storm. This isn't before the storm hit. This isn't when fear was so great that they were wondering if their lives were going to be preserved. This is after the fact. This is after they saw the great and the mighty hand of God at work. 
They made their vows after the danger had passed. They were not seeking God for what he could do for them, but simply because he displayed his vast power and his greatness. This, my friends, is the beginning for them of a very true faith. And so, isn't it ironic that Jonah wanted nothing to do with the salvation of pagan idolaters? He wanted nothing to do with the salvation of those who are far from God. He did not want to speak of the greatness and the mercy of God to those who are far from him. And so what does he do? He runs in the opposite direction. From his calling to preach mercy, but in the end, it was pagan foreigners. It was pagan idolaters. It was those who were far from God who were exactly the ones Jonah ends up converting. And these are the ones who begin to commit their lives to him. See, Jonah's actions, his self-sacrifice for the betterment of his neighbors, began a stirring in their hearts that settled when the greatness of God appeared in the calming of the storm. And my friends, I hope that our actions, that our love for God, that yes, is a vertical love for God that spills out upon our world, I hope that our actions will also speak so boldly to our neighbors. I pray that we would be committed to loving God so much that we are also then committed to loving our neighbors in some radical and some generous ways. And I hope and I pray daily for our neighbors and for those I have influence in their lives and for those I'm in relationship with who are far from God. I pray daily and I hope that we as a people can pray daily that our actions might speak so boldly of the love of God for them. But today, perhaps you are feeling far from God. And I want you to take a moment to invite you to consider the sacrifice that God has made on your behalf. You feel like you're far from God. You feel like you've been running. You feel like because of what you have done, there's no way that God could ever love you. I've been there. I get that. But I want to invite you into a prayer, into acknowledging and recognizing the substitution of Christ on your behalf. I want you to invite you to consider and to recognize the love of God for you and what he has accomplished for you in placing himself in the place that you deserve to be. And then he has invited you into a brand new life. A life of hope and a life of grace and a life of forgiveness and a life built upon a foundation of love that will outstand, withstand any storm that might come your way. So if you're at that point, if you're at that point in your life where you're just tired of running and you're tired of being far from God and you're ready to turn around, then I invite you into this prayer and then I'm going to provide us a few discussion questions so that this important message can continue with us throughout the rest of the day. Would you please pray with me? Father in heaven, symbolically, Father, I I lift my hands to you, um, holding all of my guilt out before you. And sometimes it can be scary to do this, Father, because when I acknowledge my shame and acknowledge what I've done, acknowledge how far I've run and acknowledge that I am broken, Father, it's, um, it's scary to be that exposed. And I admit, Father, that I have tried to run and I have tried to hide and I have tried to cover it up and I have blame shifted a lot. Some of us have tried to drink it away or drug it away or do any sorts of other things, Father, to cover up our problems. But I just acknowledge right now, Father, that, that I am a sinner and that I am far from you. But I believe in this moment, Father, I believe that you have come into this world to take my place and to take all of the sin and all this junk that I carry around in my heart, in my soul, in my mind, and in my body, Father, and I lay it before you, Father, and I lay it down at your cross, and you say that you will come and you will condemn it to death on the cross, and in exchange, as a substitution, you will give me your life and your spirit of love and joy and peace. And I need this, Father, and I, and I ask for it, and I want it so badly. And so today, Father, I place my trust in who you are. 
and I place my trust in what you've accomplished for me. And I thank you, Father, and I glorify your name, and I recognize your greatness. And now, Father, I ask that my life might be a great testimony to the world. That my actions and my love for you because of what you have done for me, Father, might spill out upon the world. I will not conceal it. I will not just have a vertical relationship that is unconcerned for my neighbor, but I will love my community and my neighbors and my friends in a radical and in a generous way because you have done that for me. May your life begin to grow in me. And Father, may my life then look like yours. Thank you that you have taken my place. Thank you for the life that you've given me. We do pray this in the mighty and glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer today, I would encourage you just to hit this button uh, if you're watching us online. If you're watching us on Facebook, I would encourage you to get a hold of us. We would love to continue a relationship with you and help you grow in this journey of becoming more like Jesus. One of the ways that we can do that is by continuing this conversation. And here are a couple questions to help you do that. Maybe at dinner tonight, maybe even just after this service, you want to sit down with those you're with and continue this conversation. Maybe at your house group or your small group, you could discuss these as well. Question one, what happens to relationships when we only see how we are different than others? What happens when we focus on what unites us? Do you have examples in your life of how you've done both, of how you've only focused on the differences in other people and how you've also focused on what unites you? Number two, what would a vertical-only faith look like? Why is this so appealing to so many? Why, if we are honest with the world, and we're going to talk more about this next week, why are so many people this way? Why do we only have a vertical relationship with, with God, and why do we think that's sufficient? Number three, why does our vertical love for God have to have horizontal implications? Why is that so important? What makes that a genuine relationship with God? Number four, what other types of fuel do we as humans often attempt to run on? And why are all of these fuels so destructive? Number five, why do you think some people have a hard time believing all of their sin has been paid for and all of God's wrath on sin has been poured out on Jesus? Why is that so hard for some people to believe and to own and to live with? And finally, do your actions and behavior toward non-Christians speak on behalf of a God who loves them? That's a bad sentence right there. It should have loves them at the end of that. Do your actions and behavior towards non-Christians speak on behalf of a God who loves them? Thank you for joining us today. We are going to sing one final song to conclude our time together.
Hey, thank you again for joining us on this online platform today. We do encourage you, if you're ready to venture out, next week at 9 a.m., we will be again outside on the lawn. So if you're comfortable, please join us there. Otherwise, again, uh, we will have this online experience available to you from now and always into the future. Hey, next week, uh, Jonah is going to get tossed over that boat. He's going to hit those waters, and he is going to begin to sink down into the depths of the sea. And this is where this classic uh, Jonah and the whale, right? Jonah and the great fish story. We are going to meet that fish. We're going to learn such a very, very important truth about the grace of God and all that Jonah experiences in that fish. Man, this is a life-changing message, my friends. I would encourage you to join us next week and also invite those you know as we learn about the incredible and the amazing grace of God. Hope to see you then. God bless.